So my, my introduction to this talk is a little bit meandering because it considers what is a seemingly simple question, uh, which turns out to be anything but simple. Namely, what can we learn from uh, reflecting on the fate of racial justice in the UK and elsewhere in the global north? Now, it's a question, of course, that's been raised amidst ongoing conversations about racism and the prospects for anti-racism, in which some people are viewed as seeing as a, as a moment in which they're in turning point. Yeah? Globally, we all saw the Black Lives Matter uh, movement dovetail with the racial disparities. Um, amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the response or the non-response of a number of states to the underlying inequalities that each laid bare. And in the UK, racialized minorities mobilized on these concerns and in ways that are not easily explained um, in standard social movements uh, literatures, which try and use models of, you know, you have a movement expansion, you have a transformation, then you have a contraction. And, and, and kind of anti-racist struggles in the UK are explained well through that way of thinking about social movements because um, anti-racist struggles in the UK, you know, they're necessarily continuous, they have a genealogy to them, um, they're not temporarily bounded towards one moment, but also that um, what Let's Back and colleagues have called the staging of the pol of political participation, end quote, um, of anti-racist mobilization um, has a much more expansive idea of what the political is, right? just about one movement at one time. And yet, um, at the same time, I think we've all um, also been struggling to keep pace with what we might characterize as a ledger of, um, oh, there we are, as a ledger of racial, uh, as an increasing ledger of racial injustice. And it's a kind of politics which has explicitly made a virtue uh, of racism, uh, and in a way that might be qualitatively different. I say might because the extent to which contemporary racism is explained by reference to consistent sociological tendencies is, is of course, key. Um, as the fate of uh, Marcus Rashford's mural uh, might have reminded us, kind of any answer to this opening question should grasp that while specific events may be distinctive, they necessarily also reflect a past which in some sense is still living in the present. Now that includes how racial injustice is an intrinsic feature of societies in the global north, where a kind of racial contract prevails and is apparent in how nation states have seldom recognized their very formation through imperial or colonial systems which were built on racism, let alone their contemporary social or political or economic legacies. And I'm in that camp um, that thinks that um, there's a dynamic category of race which precedes forms of imperialism uh, and colonialism. Um, in my view, race serves as a concept and as a category, it serves as what's sometimes called an explanance for coloniality, which is the explanandum. And to frame it in those terms borrows from the writers Hempel and Oppenheim, who wanted to use these terms to understand the relationship between um, kind of concepts and then the events in their terms certain specified antecedent conditions, end quote. So if we follow people's histories of stages of European empires, for example, uh, and I've got in mind particularly um, Pagden's two stages. You think about the colonization of the Americas from 1492 to the 1830s, and then the colonization of Asia, Africa, and the Pacific from the 1730s onwards. Race is the most consistent thread that runs through these periods. Uh, and working outwards from uh, the US, it's for these kinds of reasons that uh, the late Charles Mills argued in his book, The Racial Contract, that um, social contracts uh, that established liberal democracies um, have also been domination contracts. Because in the same, very same moment that they um, agree to treat uh, populations um, as political, <laughs> they also recognize the rights of states and some members of those populations to dominate non-whites, um, which is what Mill means by the racial contract. And drawing from people like Carol Pateman and other feminist scholars, what, what, John, what um, um, Charles Mills wants to do is turn thinking about racial justice on its head, um, especially, especially the work of figures like John Rawls, um, to consider not how you would uh, create an ideal basic uh, structure from ground zero, but how you would dismantle an already existing unjust structure. So I follow that and I will follow that in the talk. 
Um, but instead, I want to fold racial justice into a tradition, a tradition that's been underway um, over a period of time, uh, rather than reduce it to a single kind of theory. And I want to reinscribe the idea of racial justice with sociological content. And doing so shows us how racial injustice, therefore, is often co-constituted across different um, social domains and what I've called in that book ancillary social spheres. Now, this also challenges people like Charles Mills, especially in his idea of corrective justice, which I'll come to uh, in a moment. Because my second argument today is that there's no likely end to the struggle uh, for racial justice, only the promise that it heralds uh, and the desire to persevere, even despite often uh, of uh, knowing uh, you know, there'll be likely failure. And that's the cruel optimism uh, of racial justice. And it's an organizing idea that borrows from the work of the writer Lauren Berlant. And she had a very influential take on what she characterized as a, as a cultural logic, which she said was being played out in American society after the Second World War, where the idea of a good life was increasingly unachievable. And it's an interesting account, it's complex, it draws upon our history, trauma theory, political studies. But optimism in her argument isn't the same as being naive or being co-opted by state agencies and such like, but it describes a sincere attempt to repair, I quote, what may be constitutively broken. Yet in Balance account, the very idea of racial justice stands outside of it because the promise of the good life that occupies her, her, her analysis um, um, is, uh, is not something that was on the table um, for racialized minorities. But there's something in Berlant's account which is so important, and it's the effective move um, in anti-racist mobilizations, um, which are kind of embodied by anti-racist actors. Um, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, because I think that without the focus on that kind of issue of affect, thirdly, my third and final argument today will be that it's really hard to describe what motivates, I think, the pursuit of racial justice as something that's felt and embodied by racial minorities or indeed how racial majorities feel the right to enact racial injustices within prevailing social systems. So the third and final argument is that we need to be more attentive to the social production of moral indifference in social systems that make ordinary racial injustice without, without requiring, requiring any kind of premeditated um, individual actions. Um, and that, I argue, minimally requires us to recognize how projects of whiteness are integral to a kind of a crisis ordinariness and social justice um, that I'll come to. Okay, so what are being meant by racial justice? So sociologists don't typically talk about just um, at a theoretical level, um, either of a kind of a deontological, theoretical thing or the moral thing. Uh, even though we're very interested in matters of justice, you know, we approach it indirectly through a number of different ways of thinking. Um, and so I turned to the work of Charles Mills, um, who is a political philosopher by training, uh, and especially his treatment of, of the writer John Rawls and his theory of justice. And the argument that Charles Mills makes is that um, racial injustice is in no way kind of an afterthought or a deviation from an ostensibly faceless uh, set of Western ideals, but rather actually quite central in shaping the constituent of those ideals. Uh, and what it comes with for all is, is what he describes as an inverted epistemology um, or an epistemology of ignorance. Uh, um, and he says that that's not accidental, and I quote, but it relies upon a schedule of structured blindness um, uh, in order to establish and maintain a white quality, uh, end quote. And so to address this, Charles Mills invites us to examine racial justice outside the realm of a kind of a Rawlsian ideal theory. And, and I very much share with Mills the view that while, you know, we talk about racial justice in very obvious ways, the, the content of it um, needs to be given greater real world content and not left to a theoretical domain. But in so doing, I think it means that we end up going beyond um, Mills, especially in how he sees racial justice as primarily, I quote, not preemptive measures to prevent racial injustice, but corrective measures to rectify injustices that have already occurred. And my argument is that racial justice is it, multi-temporal. It traverses that which has happened in the past, which is happening in the present, and that which is likely to occur in, in the future. Um, 
Racial injustices are not of one kind, nor are they settled, but they, they're related because different racial projects can share different, similar kind of racial logics. So, so I diverge from Rawls in neither anchoring a consideration of racial justice in a debate with Rawls, nor focusing on collective measures only. The point of understanding our present moment is also to try to grasp what may be manifest uh, in our future. So in addition to kind of an analytical argument, and this is also a moral argument, I think, uh, and that's okay, because I think the social sciences are full of moral arguments, not necessarily in terms of what's right or what's wrong, but in terms of what are our guiding lights, what's the social impetus um, for doing what we do, the inquiries that we engage in, which is about more than prudential concerns, what's, what's a good idea uh, to do something. Um, I take from Mills both the idea that our present um, can't be understood without reflecting on, on successes and defeats accrued over time, um, and that's only by focusing on how in and against um, projects of, of race making that we can overcome some of the chasm between discussions of justice in an ideal sense and actually uh, the struggles for justice um, that may be occurring. And there's a rich and necessarily empirical story, therefore, to tell, um, which should be front and centre in any discussion of racial justice. Take the mere six years in the UK since Theresa May, uh, in, in which Theresa May was in office, uh, between, um, no, it's now seven years, isn't it, since she was in office, uh, since coming uh, and going. Um, hang on. Six years, 2016, yeah, so it's seven years. Um, and her promise on, down, on the steps of Downing Street to tackle the, the burning injustices in that six, uh, now seven years uh, approaching, you know, we've had up to 57,000 uh, black and minority ethnic Britons who may, we don't entirely know, but may have been deported or stripped of their citizenship. Uh, and the new nationality and borders that will strengthen the power to deprive minoritized Britons uh, further of their status. Uh, meanwhile, the police crime and sentence of course, the legislation which the Home Office admit, I quote, may cause indirect difference of treatment on the grounds of race, end quote, passed into law uh, last year. What this means, I think, is that racial progress uh, in, or, or, or the progress in, in, in trying to address racial injustices um, is not only far on occasion from advancing, but also some things get demonstrably worse at the same time. That includes how in the last decade, the extent to which black children and young people are disproportionately targeted by the youth justice system has increased. So as the, you can't quite see this, can you? You have to take my word for it. I'll read the book. Um, as the youth justice statistics for 2018-19 in England and Wales show, black children who make up about 4% of the entire population aged between 10 to 17 years um, are four times more likely to be arrested than their white counterparts, and they're three times more likely to receive a, a caution or custodial sentence. So in 2019, the percentage of black children in custody has significantly increased to 28% of the entire youth justice um, population, from 4% to 28%. And that's compared with 15% um, a decade previously. So it's kind of doubled over that period. Um, and, you know, code has been at the forefront, I'm, I'm going to skip over on this topic, I don't think people in the room can really see it, but code has been at the forefront, I think, of this kind of data collection analysis. So I'm, I'm very reticent to tell you to some extent what you already know, given that you probably played a role in, 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 in this data collection uh, in the first instance. But in the book, I dwell quite a lot on labour markets, where in testing for racial discrimination in recruitment processes, you know, you can show that racial minorities were much less likely to be successful in their application. Uh, even after discounting for differences um, in age and education. And that hasn't stopped, it hasn't decreased, um, because when sociologists use what's sometimes called the match pairs method, where at least two applications with similar content but different names are submitted, you still discover um, significant ethnic penalties. And that's obviously something which relates to the early part of, a, of, a, of trying to enter the labour market, you know, the pre-interview stage. Um, but in one study, researchers um, sent out had to send out 74% more applications for minority ethnic candidates compared to the white counterparts. Um, and so, partly building upon these, colleagues have, have undertaken this um, 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 uh, uh, kind of um, analysis using um, odds ratios, which uh, describes the probability of a positive response from an employer 
um, all the, and all the probability of being employed um, in intervention for the labour market. The, the clear findings from this cohort of work, and this is work that Anthony Heath and colleagues have been using. On the one side of this slide, you see data from the Department of Work and Pension, and on the other side, you see new research that they undertook themselves. The key point is that even though there are variations in terms of the experiences of ethnic and racial minorities in relation to each other, all, despite having the same skills and qualifications, are fair significantly less likely than their white counterparts. Um, so, and what I call in the book kind of ancillary social spheres tries to kind of speak to these interconnections between how different, how racial equalities in one domain have an implication for racial inequalities in other, in other domains. I'm not going to dwell too much on data, but I'll just quickly just want to say something about this, because when we cast our mind back to the um, earliest COVID mortality data from the ONS, uh, it was quickly apparent. Uh, in England and Wales, at least, that black groups were significantly more likely, four times more likely, to die uh, from COVID-19 uh, compared with their white uh, counterparts. And the, the, the kind of social spheres, uh, the interconnected social spheres, um, which might explain these, were often missing from yeah. the account. Um, right, here we go. Um, instead, what would happen is that the kind of the physiological risks of the pandemic would be uncoupled from the systematic experience. Exposures, so often would be missed how the group who had the high mortality rate were often the groups who were working in uh, frontline or, 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 or key sector or, or key sector, uh, frontline services or in key sectors. So, you know, in London, where some of the disparities were the greatest, black and ethnic minorities were three times more likely to be uh, key workers in some sectors, it was especially pronounced five times more likely to be in food production, um, three and a half times more likely to be in social care. And so on. Um, and as her findings into the uh, inquiry um, commissioned by the Labour Party um, um, indicated, um, black, and ethnic, black and Asian my, ethnic my ethnic people, she argued, uh, um, were overexposed, underprotected, and stigmatized. Um, this was Doreen, uh, Baroness Doreen Lawrence's um, inquiry, which she undertook on behalf of the Labour Party, and in which she um, called for a, a, a desire, called for a um, um, a movement or a kind of a, a desire to what she called break with the clear and tragic pattern. Um, and in many respects, when I read that, I felt okay. Well, this is an attempt once again to try to pivot from a perpetual crisis to a turning point, um, and it's a way in which it demonstrates the, the cruelty of um, an embodied hope for racial justice, you know, this desire to engage and try to change system um, is one that nonetheless, you know, endures despite the frequent and sobering evidence of some already entrenched racial inequalities which deepen uh, even uh, further. And, you know, it's something which is uh, which occurs despite um, any number of parliamentary publications since 2009, which have made important recommendations for addressing uh, racial inequalities in Britain. Relatively few of the recommendations from these inquiries and these reports have been um, adopted. And in one case, um, and it's replied to the Joint Committee on Human Rights report, the present UK government replied to the finding that Black Londoners had less confidence in policing with the um, explanation, I quote, this is the cabinet office. Other factors outside the, the police's control uh, may be responsible for this, including media reporting, bias, and the use of statistics, end quote. Yes, right. So then it's clinging to the hope of a substantive governmental kind of leadership on this matter, an example of something which kind of actively impedes the aim that brought you to it, you know, initially. Uh, and this is a sentiment I think that Doreen Lawrence was trying to encourage us to move on from um, something, you know, which is empirically documented in a number of, number of ways. Um, and so it's a question worth asking because what each of these findings and reports make clear is that to ignore the role of racism as an explanatory factor actually requires you to, 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 to actively ignore it. Um, 
And so for, therefore, any kind of um, account of where racial justice is today in the UK needs to be able to grasp with that kind of crisis orderliness that, that it portrays. And this is kind of what I mean by the crisis ordinance. And taking once more from Ballon, what's kind of meant by crisis is related but different to describing, you know, the structural contradictions of economic life, uh, which give rise to crisis and that, you know, um, falling rates of uh, profit, or, or the kind of strain theory, which I think is discussed in certain criminological tradition. Crisis ordinariness, uh, Lauren Ballon, I think, offers a meaning, means through which we can access a description of uh, systematic dysfunction, which almost comes to form a genre through which we um, make sense of the dilemmas of the present. Uh, and namely, you know, a very real and necessary belief in the possibility of changing what is constitutively broken and that our work uh, and our investment um, in this work um, relies upon, I think. And I, I don't think this is unproblematic, not least because it feels very intangible, but I see how it allows us to bring together, you know, questions of affect and social systems into the story of, of racial racial justice and injustice. And, and thinking in these terms, I think, can be understood as part of a wide, or sometimes called a, a wider political economy of effects, which tries to theorize the role of emotions uh, in politics in kind of challenging and disrupting and reconfiguring politics uh, in ways that might, um, in ways that aren't reducible to individuals uh, alone. And this is um, Sarah Ahmed when she talks about how emotions um, and their role in, in social mobilizations for justice struggles um, are very concrete. You know, they mediate the relationship between the psychic and the social, between the individual and the collective. Uh, and in so doing, you know, we, we start to then uh, join and expand this critique of the idea of progress towards racial justice as something which is teleological and incrementally um, improves over time. Things can get simultaneously worse and better at the same time. Um, and to my mind, you know, that view of progress rests in what Ballant calls its optimism's double blind, in which an image of a better good life creates an impasse almost at a time that doesn't allow us easily to detach ourselves from things that aren't working. And for researchers and policymakers and, and, and activists um, committed to the pursuit of racial justice, there's something in this in the need to reckon with probably what we've long borne witness to and often made a difficult peace with, if I'm honest, uh, which comes not in a single event um, or an episode, but, which is more like akin to, a, you know, kind of like an undulating, undulating pain or a discomfort that, that, that we sit with. Um, and some thinkers, uh, some listeners, you know, to this will, will recognise themselves in how we routinely arrive at this impasse and perhaps even clung to in different ways, you know, the cruel optimism that racism in our societies um, will lessen because some attitudes uh, are self-evident, less, less self evidently less hostile, um, which signals to us that the kind of systemic injustices can also wither and change through concerted action over time. Now, that's not an admission of naivety or admission of of misplaced hope, in the, uh, uh, misplaced faith in, in hope for change, or having been you know, hostage to the belief that everything's going to turn out all right in the end. You know, as Hassan, Hassan Haid has argued, you, know, you have to have an incredibly impoverished sense of political efficacy if you fail to see that you know, speaking truth to power, quote unquote, is not just one action, but instead a whole strategic field, right? which requires knowing when and how to speak. Um, but the cruel optimism of racial justice is necessarily dispersed across that field. Uh, and in a constant struggle, you know, for something better, something possible, perhaps most keenly expressed in Neville Lawrence's statement to the McPherson inquiry into the racist murder of his 17-year-old son. We have to look forward, he insisted, saying, this is a very small place, this world of ours. We have to live together, we have to say, let Let's put the past be uh, behind us. Let's join hands and go forward. Now, these words spoken by a parent surviving bereavement appeal to the possibility that grief furnishes a sense of political uh, furnishes a sense of political community, you know, of a complex order. And it does this first of all by bringing to the fore the kind of relational ties that have implications um, for, for for understanding our ethical responsibility to one another. But they're also words. For a, uh, the profound words for, for calling for a better society and you know one 
that's so much better than that which so cruelly took his son, but which some 20 years later feel very much unheeded, um, and in ways that remind us that the past then as the past now is as much uh, ahead of us as it is behind us. And, and by broadening the kind of aperture to observe the racialized nature of social and political systems that give rise to the racial injustices um, that we describe, I think can help us to understand how the outcomes can occur without any premeditated intentionality. Uh, and there's long been tools within social sciences to study how racism um, is best um, conceived of through a kind of a, system, a systemic uh, approach. Um, and, um, you know, people like Bonilla Silva's um, account of um, racialized social systems brought the idea of, of systems back into, into mainstream orthodox social science. Um, I've thought of system thinking within racial justice movements, um, within the study of racial justice movements as an idiom. And by idiom, I mean a way of describing a series of, of um, of social dynamics, which span agency, they span structure, and which share a kind of family resemblance across different versions of that. And the holism in that, you know, it's not accidental. Um, it relies upon a kind of a methodological concern with not to um, silo off outcomes within one particular domain, but to see their, see their interlinking uh, nature. Um, and the social sciences have to some extent, you know, had a had a discontinuous relationship with thinking about social systems because for a long time they were used in ways in which helped explain existing inequalities rather than studying um, why those inequalities uh, occurred. Um, and I won't dwell too much on this, but it's just to say that you know um, some of the critical thinking through systems was brought brought um, brought back to the social sciences uh, and to some extent informed people like Vanilla Silver uh, via uh, critical race theory, um, which I think is central to trying to understand um, understand the ways in which there is often a deep and systemic um, um, a racist um, configuration to, to the way in which societies operate. And, you know, I think it's as relevant to me as it is to anybody else who's interested in inequality in race, but I also want to productively differ from that kind of an approach not least in wanting to reflect on the need to understand the relationships between um, different racial projects and social systems, which tries to help us to explain the ways in which race can change over time and over place. Uh, it's not purely of, of one kind. Um, and my interest in conceiving of you know, the social through, um, through the idiom of systems is instead to try to be able to focus um, attention on the specific features of any given um, uh, social order, uh, while recognizing that within it, you know, there's also um, social processes which are not predetermined um, and, are, and uh, are, which, uh, are, are easily crowded out by an overly um, deterministic frame of thinking about what the outcomes will be. And this is something which is nicely taken up in Ruha Benjamin's book. Um, race after technology. Uh, it's a very rich study of the role of algorithms in, in social life, which she calls the new gym code. Uh, she uses that to describe the ways in which contemporary tech designers um, can encode judgments into technical systems, but claim that the, um, the racial injustice which occurs, the racist results of their design are entirely exterior to the encoding process. And in this way, she argues that, you know, racism become, becomes doubled, it becomes magnified, it becomes buried in new layers of digital denial, quote unquote. Um, and it's almost a new frontier of thinking about systems um, in terms of their social impact, um, moving away slightly from thinking purely in terms of the system as how it operates within a given social domain. Um, and I think the example illustrates not only the kind of interaction between systems and different and new racial projects, the fact that when I go to an airport, my attributes set off alarm bells. Um, um, but it also kind of overcomes what's sometimes a bit of a boundary problem in thinking about systems. You know, think about systems as being something which is uh, demarcated to a particular sphere or something which occurs at the state level, something which occurs in 
um, um, something parallel to that. Um, the joint of thinking which allows us to understand the ways in which intentionality doesn't have to be a driving feature of systemic racial outcomes, I think is really quite important, which takes us to the social production um, and reproduction of a, of a kind of a, a moral indifference, which kind of gets wedded to that. And there's something in what um, Sarah Ahmed has described as becoming, um, uh, or, or making it kind of willful to talk about racism as if um, talking about racism is what is divisive. Um, and racism formally recedes from social consciousness or it becomes so normalized that to make a, uh, an issue of it, you almost are the person who is bringing it up, bringing it into existence, end quote. And what I think Balance motif about cruel optimism um, and crisis ordinariness allows us to see is that while shocking racial inequalities may appear uh, traumatic when accounted for at one moment. Um, those of us in the pursuit of, of, of racial justice have kind of, to some extent, um, adapted ourselves to this kind of systemic crisis, this crisis ordinariness, uh, in which you know the outcome already tends to be something in the works. So instead, you know, kind of seeing seeing racial um, injustice as conventional, not exceptional, something which is drawn across social systems. Uh, allows us to better name the kind of social production of moral indifference that accompanies it. Um, and I think that's the key to understanding uh, the cruel optimism of racial uh, injustice. It foregrounds how policy promoting um, anti racism sometimes end up focusing on what might be unambiguous forms of racism, either, either <coughs> simultaneously to there being this proliferation or this normalization. Uh, of new forms of, of, of racial thinking. Now, just to wrap up, none of this should try and, you know, encourage a totalizing approach to thinking about um, anti-racist struggles to racial justice, uh, something which forecloses agency, minimizes resistance, collapses the refusal of racial minorities, sees them as mere <coughs> objects of racial systems. On the contrary, it's just to reiterate that um, the, the kind of the cruel optimism of racial justice isn't the same as defeat. Um, instead, what it kind of speaks to, I suppose, is the continuing insistence for better social systems. The point is that the burden of that labor is asymmetrical. It lands disproportionately upon um, those who are racialized as minorities um, and who can see in many respects as self-evident some of these truths. Um, and a fundamental rebalancing of that I suppose it's only really going to be possible when the beneficiaries of that social production, moral indifference, recognise that this is their load to bear as well. And, you know, as a society, we have to reckon with the social and the moral cost of racial injustice, but also for the necessary imagination which takes us beyond uh, and through that understandable despair. And as an academic, it of course makes sense to think that cumulatively the work that we do and the work that you do. Um, is a means or a path to that. Uh, and if that's a motive that binds us to this kind of cruel optimism um, presently, that, that may that doesn't necessarily have to be our future too. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, thank you. Very, yes, thanks. Um, uh, thanks very much, Nasser. That was brilliant. And uh, we have lots of time for questions, and I'm sure um, your presentation raised a lot of uh, questions and connections in everyone's minds. So if you're in the room, um, feel free to raise your hand. And if you're uh, on Zoom, please also feel free to raise your hand, and I'll try to navigate between them. Um, who'd like to start? Claire? Um, thanks for that, Nasser. Um, I, I mean, I, I honestly agree with that. I'm wondering a couple of things. One is around the kind of... Um, the silence, which I get, the kind of way in which people don't want to talk about racial injustice, they find other ways for they recode it as something else, and they just refuse to talk about it. Or there was that very interesting Tony Fool article where he talks about how Boris Johnson said to him, he doesn't feel he doesn't feel comfortable with the race question, so that kind of gets you know sidelined off. But I'm partly thinking about the other side of it, which is the noise around racial injustice. So you talk about the kind of moral indifference. Yeah, it seems to me that a lot of the public story at the moment is around consumed with kind of moral outrage, which does nothing. So I just wonder what you thought about that whole kind of, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever her name is, Susan Hussey or whatever, you know, that, or 
I'm obsessed with cats. I don't know why I'm obsessed with cats. I'm always never going to read, let's face it. But, um, you know, the, the kind of outrage about that, oh, did he say the, 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 the barbecue was racist, but now he's saying it's not racist. Oh, that's really terrible. And, you know, so there's a lot of noise yeah. around. I wonder how that squares with your kind of idea around it. Yeah. I mean, and I guess it comes down to the same bar in different terms of not wanting to change structures, but I wonder yeah. how you have a conception. Well, I mean, it's the wrong noise about the wrong issues, isn't it? Um, and maybe, you know, there's another way of thinking about all this and to characterize the, the problems of those problems of ideology, you know, and I, I just don't, I, I think that kind of flattened an understanding of, of people's, where people are at and, and what they do and why they do it. I think that some of the moral outrage around questions of, uh, of race presently are, you know, that are manufactured, typically all but around manufactured conceit. It's not the in plain sight, we have increased profoundly the incarceration of young black folks. In plain sight, uh, the, the numbers of young people double over a period of time to the extent where 4% end up representing 28% of the entire number of children you could. I mean, that you have to, and, and, and that there's a level of knowledge about that. There's a level of public knowledge about that. In fact, informed not only you know popular culture but, but it's kind of there it's a feature of the things that are raised by anti-racist um activists you know it's what most, when people say defund the police they're talking about um the over surveillance and the encounter with the state um which is disproportionately targeting you know young black boys so this stuff is out there but the moral outrage doesn't occur about those things it occurs about whether or not megan's being disloyal and or something else so that's kind of what I mean about the moral indifference. Um, I mean, if you think that a better way to put it is to say that there is um, kind of a moral distraction, yeah, I can, I can probably sign up to that too. Um, but, you know, given the nature, and we were talking earlier in our meeting about the census statistics and um, the rate and complexities of contemporary ethnic and racial dynamics, you know, this is not when we were growing up, well, certainly when we were growing up in the 70s and 80s, you know, the kind of the, the rates of interaction mixing and so on, and the normalization of, of, of non whiteness is a feature of British life, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's accompanied by this willing uh, blindness to what are quite profound um, disparities. So that's kind of what I mean that people can have, um, people can be part of something which they think is, you know, multiracial, multi ethnic, and yet be totally okay with. Um, the disparities which are you know, life altering for those who are receiving it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I take your point then. I mean, race, it's not, I, you know, it's not the case that race isn't discussed, it's just, it's not racial injustice not discussed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. There's a question in the chat from Sylvia Comey that in many ways builds on Claire's question. Um, <coughs> Sylvia is also thinking about Harry's book, Intentionally or Not, and says uh, that that book has led to a lot of discussion about the concept of unconscious bias. There's an argument that it is another form of racism denial. What are your thoughts on that? And if I can take the chair's prerogative because I have the same question. Um, I also noted a couple of instances in your talk when you mentioned that intentionality doesn't need to be a deliberate feature um, of racial injustice and also um, uh, Charles Mills's concept of, of racism as a, a scheduled of structured mm. blindness. Um, that, that seems to stand in contrast to the notion that racism is something unconscious or, or um, mm. something individualized. Um, so could you comment on how your work might speak back to the concept yeah. of unconscious bias? Well, I mean, the, the features of the unconscious bias, which actually resonate with some of the understanding, actually, of institutional racism, that there's an unwitting uh, racism. Um, but the other part of the, the concern with institutional racism is a focus on the role of institutions which curate and cultivate that. And the unconscious bias stuff just seems to be free floating, and yeah. people have just woken up one day and they're unconsciously aware of <coughs> these profound, um, profoundly, oh, grossly um, uh, racist ways of, of conducting themselves or, or, or behaving, which, you know, isn't even called <laughs> racism, it's just called bias, as if it's something which is uh, a minor minor problem uh, of cultural competency rather than a, a, a racial disparity. I mean, the language of, uh, you know, one way of thinking about the language of impartial bias is to say that it's a HR exercise to make understanding mm -hmm. racism more palatable, right? So the interest in um, 
It's a schedule of structured blindness by um, Mills. He's going to say, well, actually, this is something that's based in hardwired into a, a given social contract. And maybe that's another way of thinking about institutional race mm -hmm. um, in terms of the terms of reference. For this. You know, that there is something with which is so core, but necessarily uh, un, inexplicit um, in the operation of an institution or an organization. Um, which is partly reflected in, in the outcomes that, that proceed from the work that it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Adam. Uh, thanks, and so that was uh, really interesting. And I completely agree with your idea of um, cruel optimism, but I was thinking as well, does it also depend on who's talking about the, the restructuring or the reframing? Because I understand that when the government talks about societal change or structural change, that optimism there is you can question and say well this is just um you know spoken mirrors Whereas if you're say talking about issues that government doesn't want to talk about say reparations maybe you can be optimistic about um you know the people who are bringing up these structural changes so do you think it it depends who's discussing them and, and who's suggesting them that is where you know maybe some optimism isn't cruel but it depends who's suggesting those changes so, I mean, the subject object distinction in the way in which you put it, it's interesting. I, I wasn't thinking about it in those terms, but, but I take the point that the question's raising. I suppose I was thinking about it more in terms of the focus on racist, um, racial justice struggles. So, to tell a story about um, um, anti racism within the UK, how it's developed over time, and what still motivates um, actors who um, mobilise and invest a great deal of time and energy and focus and everything else. Um, in a way, it doesn't really matter in terms of what objective governments may or may not have. Uh, it obviously matters in terms of the outcome, but, but the cruel optimism of that is the one which is held by, by the people who are mobilising, I suppose. Um, but again, I don't want to be monolithic about this, because a number of times I think we've all worked with people in the policy process, and they may well be civil servants. I mean, I've certainly, I, I worked with, on the Racist Disparity Audit, and I worked with civil servants who were fully signed up to the things that I was signed up to. Um, and they did good work, and they created a data set, which was very hard to then just uncouple and and, and do away with, even though it's you know, withered on the wine a little bit. You know, it, it was important in highlighting um, features of, of, of a system that um, otherwise, you know, was easily denied. So, you know, I, I don't present this in terms of state activists and researchers. I think there's a lot of fluidity across this, but the optimism is that which is motivated, uh, motivating the activity um, for racial justice, I suppose. Yeah, thanks. Um, Trying to jump back and forth between the room and the chat, so apologies um, if I if I don't see your question right away. Um, for those on Zoom, there was a really interesting conversation in the chat um, that people sharing resources. Um, but Penny Rabinger asks, uh, I'm interested in anti-racism in schools and how an act of liberalist indignation in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder and quote the right thing to do, and how it becomes increasingly interpreted as subversive and radical and gets reframed outside the remit of so-called teacher impartiality. What are your thoughts on this as a methodology to combat anti-racism, which is beyond both ignorance? Yeah, uh, there's a lot in that question. Yeah. There's a lot in that question. And again, it takes us back to the prior conversation the number of colleagues were having here earlier today in terms of what's the legacy of those statements, to what extent were they transformative, and to what extent were they transformative. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the place of education within this, especially within the national curriculum in this country, is often very limited. Um, you know, um, the kind of um, anti-racist education which was aspired to, in, on some occasions, achieved. Um, well, the best thing that could be said about it is had a very uneven journey to through um, the British education system since um, the mid 80s. And uh, more critically, one could say that the national curriculum launders race and, and racial inequality from, you know, from what it delivers, insofar as it will compartmentalize it into features of a black history month, but beyond that will not teach British history in a way in which takes into account, you know, its full, um, full features, nor indeed will it tell 
uh, a contemporary story about the ways in which children who are in, in an institutional setting, which is historically um, um, a discrimination against um, some members of the school population on the basis of their characteristics, um, you know, creates what's often called a pri uh, school to prison pipeline. You know, and these, these are the ways in which one might think of an anti racist uh, schooling experience. You know, that's presently not there within, you know, mainstream UK education, especially that which follows the national curriculum. But there are, again, there are. There are examples, counterexamples to that. There are ways in which um, local authorities have done good and interesting things, and there are standout schools which are pursued anti racist curricula. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, sits either side of, of, of the um, statements about George Floyd, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which have some you know, resonance with institutions beyond um, educational settings. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Peter. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff that you were talking about in terms of the way that <coughs> racial injustice is reproduced, rearticulated, takes on new forms, um, is the same for social injustice, mm. different kinds, you know, sexism, classism, all those kinds of injustices. So I just wondered, I mean, in terms of a yeah. structural dimension of how these things are reproduced and their ordinary ordinariness and how intentionality. Yeah. Uh, Relationship between sort of structure and agency, you know, those are very sort of yeah. uh, common processes that, that um, explain inequality and injustice of various different kinds. So I was just wondering whether you thought there was something specific to the way that racial injustice operates yeah. that makes it different in some way, or yeah. the way that it maybe interacts with other forms of injustice that creates some different kind of yeah. effect from racial injustice. Yeah. Injustice. yeah. No, that's a, that's a really, really interesting question. Thank you for asking it and putting it in those terms. Because I, I think that there are precisely, if you say, common logics of um, at work within other forms of other cleavages. Uh, what I would say is, that, and as I said at the beginning of the talk, if you share the view that to some extent, you know, modernity has been terraformed by race, then there's ways in which um, those class cleavages um, can be, um, they're not insurmountable. And everything, as you well know, you know, the story of race has taken in groups who have had this liminal relationship to, um, to the majority, to the white majority, you know, sometimes they've been in, sometimes they've been out. But there has often been a gradual desire and aspiration to be in. Um, you know, the story of the Irish in America, Italian Americans, Eastern Europeans, and you know, Eastern Europeans in the UK, and their gradual, um, their gradual kind of movement through the cleavage of, uh, of class through race. So they're now in, they're part of the white group. And so I, I think I, I give race primacy, uh, uh, both analytically, but also I think historically. Uh, and both of those points are very debatable, but that's kind of where I, where I begin. Um, but thank you, that's a really good point. Uh, next, there's a question in the chat from Libby Joseph, uh, who asks, my question concerns racial justice for NHS workers. There's a discourse in healthcare that is pushing civility and respect as a solution to workplace violences that exist, particularly the increase in disrespect and rudeness experienced in the service. Workplace violence is disproportionate impacts, uh, disproportionately impact racialized workers. Is incivility as a concept obscuring the subtle manifestations of racism? Okay, more, more, more great question. And uh, I wouldn't presume to know enough about health care settings, but the generality of that uh, are, well, to some extent, the question is what's about the duty of care of the employer to you and the people who work for you? Mm -hmm. um, there's a way in which you know standard statutory duties of care to, to clients or to users um, expects of racialized minorities more than it expects of their of their, of their white counterparts. Um, you know to be able to tolerate racism um, in in work settings, which actually isn't lawful. You know, no, no person, no minoritized person should be expected to go to work and to be subject to to racism by a client or an employer. Um, that isn't lawful. Um, but there is a particular convention that in the service of particular um, uh, particular um, care, you know, and given the complexity of people's needs, that you just 
you suck it up and move on in the interest of the greater good. Well, institutions, employers, organizations also have an obligation to, to their employees not to expect them to have to live and work in those conditions. Mm -hmm. But but you know, it's a profound ethical question as well. Um, thank you. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No, I've got uh, yes, you're at the table and then um, a couple of things. One, if I can just respond to the, the health one, um, because I've just been involved in a research project um, that looked at the experience of uh, nurses, both during the pandemic and during their working lives on, on racism, it's called Nursing Narratives Racism in the Pandemic. And um, one of the interesting things is when people talk about racism within the health service, they talk about uh, or primarily, they talk about patient racism, mm. and that um, tends to be the focus of a lot of the work that the NHS does. I mean, I know that there's lots of stuff around aggression and things as well, but um, in fact, from the interviews that we did, the thing that had the most devastating impact on staff was the failure of the institution mm. to address the racism, to support them, and that was the thing that made people feel kind of isolated. We did this also, this really tiny survey, very small survey, um, and asked, one of the questions in the survey was, um, have you ever challenged you know, racism at work? And then there was a second question, and if you have, do you feel that you were dealt with fairly? Now, the people that had challenged racism, 77.4%, this was our highest statistic, but they were not treated fairly. Mm. And within the conversations and the, you know, the interviews, I would say the thing that was the most um, impactful was, I mean, yes, of course, there were examples of like direct discrimination and victimization and all of that. But one of the underlying things was just neglect. Mm. And that was staff neglect. And so obviously if that's happening with staff, it's clearly happening in relation to patients. So there's, so that I just wanted to, you know, to raise that. It's very important that we actually talk about <coughs> racism within, you know, we all know about the snowy white peaks of the NHS, etc. Um, it's really important for us to think structurally mm -hmm. about the racism and not just be talking about the, the patient racism. In, in terms of the talk, and so I mean, I'm an activist, to be honest, you know, that's where my drive is, uh, you know, being involved in anti racist struggles. And um, I'm not sure that I, I, feel, I understand where you're coming from in terms of the, the concept of uh, cruel optimism, um, because we've all felt that disillusionment about, you know, the effort that you put in, the, the, the impact of just the level of sort of emotional labor, physical mm. labor, intellectual labor that you put into trying to create transformation um, to be knocked back often, you know, repeatedly, is it is devastating. And so, yes, there might be a sort of a naivety in terms of optimism. <coughs> but I'm also a historian. And as a historian, then we also have to think about if those struggles had not happened, where would we be today? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if we're talking about it more widely in terms of uh, social justice, we know that when the trade unions are strong, workers' rights are stronger, da 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 da, da. So it's exactly the same for all of the injustices that we're, we're facing. Oh, no. We can describe it as a cruel optimism, but I just wonder whether that's, you know, whether there's a sort of, it feels a little bit dismissive and and, and lacking optimism. I suppose that's my problem, isn't it? Um, no, well, maybe you know, not. Yeah, maybe not. And I, I agree with you. I share your analysis. I mean, I think. Um, I mean, you know, things can always be worse, <laughs> and they would be worse not for the efforts we put in. No, no, I, I agree with you entirely. And uh, I didn't say that it was naivety, okay. the optimistic. On the contrary, I was saying it wasn't that. Um, it's the almost knowing you you engage in these things you, in the knowledge that okay, it's highly unlikely this is going to work, but I'll make a dent in it, and we pick ourselves up and persevere. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you entirely, and I, and I take your first point on the um, on the wider institutional and systemic features of 
organizations and it's not just about um client or user base but that's what the question was on but your but your point is absolutely valid thank you for sharing that that's not that fascinating uh, thanks for that just um a couple of people on zoom were asking for the name of the publication or the research study that you mentioned if you go to nursing narratives I think it's called nursingnarratives.com. How can I forget? Yeah, and we've made a documentary as well, which is on there called Exposed. It's a 57-minute documentary. And there's and there is also a, a report where trying to write more stuff. Great. Whatever. Oh, thank you for sharing. Nursing narratives. Okay, so nursingnarratives.com. Everyone heard that. Uh, all right, so there's a question from um uh Miti Moape, uh, who says, Thank you so much for your talk, Professor Muir. I couldn't help but notice that you speak quite abstractly about the nature of racial injustice in the UK. Is this a consequence of the nature of speaking to racial injustice in the UK that we must significantly intellectualize humane experiences <laughs> so as to offer the discourse legitimacy? I take the chastisement in the spirit in which it's raised. No, it's just because I'm an academic and I can't help myself. But um, you know, there is often a technical language to, to social and political theory, but your point is well made, and a lot of these arguments can be um, presented in much more acceptable language. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just before we move on, there, there uh, are a couple of comments about uh, the discussion of the NHS in the chat. Um, and in particular, uh, Robert Moore says, in upper class society, it's seen as reprehensible behavior to be rude to the servants. Uh, we see notices saying that we should respect the staff, NHS, post office, council offices, etc., and that abuse will not be tolerated. But this does not address the issue of racism. Being polite to the servants is beside the point. Um, and then Victoria adds, the NHS is simply another neo-colonial institution that can only function by poaching staff from other countries, treating as indentured labor, and keeping silent through weaponized reporting to racist regulators. Um, so yeah, interesting point. Do, do, would you like to respond to either? No, I'll ask OK, great. Um, Lexi, do you have a question? Thank you so much for this. It was really good to try that. Um, my question sort of has to do with touching upon cool optimism and a sort of sense of disillusion and exhausting oscillation between us and you know, anti racist work by yourself in order to swing that optimism and having that optimism there and drive off the despair that we end up encountering. But I'm wondering then what your thoughts may be about the place of a political economy mm. of affect mm. when it comes to justice, particularly yeah. between those who are racialized and those who yeah. may not be. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I mean, what, what's coming to me immediately is sort of like redistribution of emotion, I think, of things like yeah. radical empathy. Yeah. And praxis. Vulnerability. And vulnerability, yeah. praxis is based on compassion, things like that. But one right, what's your take might be? There are many different forms of justice. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's great, great, another great question. Um so uh, quite right. So take cruel optimism, bring it back, fit it within a new political economy of affect, as I was describing in the paper. Um, think about the ways in which Sarah Ahmed tried to understand this, but also I have previously and also in the book tried to put it within a, 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 a more generative structure. And the, and the generative structure is that of the work of double E.B. Du Bois and double consciousness and this constant interaction between the psychic and the social. And the thing that Du Bois always argued about that was that well, that isn't debilitating or a trap. Actually, it's generative in terms of <coughs> turning the double, as he called it, into a into a better and truer self and society. So he talked about the ways in which, um, despite the internalization of this majority contempt, um, when turned backwards, it's actually a driver for um, moral and political progress. And through which he was talking about remaking America, right? And you know, in the time which that was a liberal Du Bois during that time, got more radical later on. But you know, you can read Du Bois in that in that, in that way um, over those periods of time. Um, but that but that speaks to a common project, and that common project is, is about remaking um, a sense of the whole, which is again why I was stressing the role of, of thinking methodologically about the whole and not in ways in which siloed um, parts off. So I think you know. Cruel optimism and, and racial justice struggles have to have an eye to you know the identity of common membership, mm -hmm. things like national identity. Um, you know, 
you know, should be an area of focus to remake and constant remaking. And, you know, you, that's true whether or not you're kind of anti-national identity or you're cosmopolitan, whether you want to think about local struggles. But, you know, there's a space. Paul Gilroy, I think, somewhere said in an 87 essay, nations, and you have to put nations somewhere. And when anti-racist um, struggles vacate that space, um, I think there's a loss in that. Um, so that remaking of, um, of a shared experience also has to speak to that, you know. And it doesn't, you know, maybe the language of national identity is the best means of accessing it, but the identity of the society as a whole um, is also something that needs to be appealed to um, in anti racist activity. Um, I mean, I, I often, I, I did I did think at one point um, when the Windrush um, um, injustices were becoming apparent that the in the, the, the kind of the instinctive um, kind of shared shared empathy of, of white population groups to the injustice was a jumping off point for a, you know a bigger and larger question. But you know it occurred in the context of so many other countervailing racialization, new racial formation, especially about. Uh, migration. Um, it almost kind of crowded out the opportunity to think with empathy. Um, but but your point's well made um, about how you scale that up and remake the whole, I think. Well, there was a question here. I just wondered if, uh, based on your theories, uh, whether you thought the, the accession to ultimate power of uh, Obama and uh, Rishi Sunak uh, <laughs> Is a, is cruel optimism, or is it a? Are they major milestones in the? Uh, what question? What question? <laughs> really towards uh, take it, take it again. Take it back to the early conversation. So, what are the many ways in which we can understand the bummer and, and Rishi Sunak? So, this is, uh, I I don't think it's it, irrelevant. Let me put it like, and I, I, actually, it's not fair to put them in the same context. I do think that the the, the history of, of race in the U.S. tell. A, a different but not unconnected story to the history of race in the UK. Yeah. Right? I think they're different racial projects, different racial formation. Um, I think, just think about Rishi Sunak for a second. I, I, uh, Rishi, so Rishi Sunak's family, Rishi Sunak's story is actually a story of empire insofar as he ended up, so his family are, um, are they Ugandan nations or Kenyan yeah. nations? Uh, in, and the, but then Southampton, via Southampton. So, I mean, there's a story of British imperialism within his family's biography that, I mean, I'm not saying that he, he, he adopts it, but you can tell a story about what Britain did in the world through the, through, partly through, you know, through his presence. Um, not that you would get any, not that, not that it's a, a story that uh, Rishi Sunak or other people around him would invoke in any critical sense, but we can. <laughs> hey, we can. So, you know, tell us how, how did your family end up in, in East Africa, Rishi Sunak? Tell us that story. Um, you know, and there's the story of, okay, well, we took indentured, we, we, we were a colonial occupation there, we took indentured workers there, we put them there, and then through a, a, a post um, a, a post colonial citizenship ration, people were here. Uh, okay, so what are the ethics of that? And I think there are opportunities to open up those spaces. I, I don't think it's irrelevant. Um, I don't think it's irrelevant. I, I think there is something in, in, in that which maybe, maybe worth exploring, uh, but maybe not in the ways in which people have sometimes used it to talk about. Yeah. Um, picking up the conversation about nations, there's a bit of a back and forth in the chat about the example of Wales. Um, and you might actually given your experience with the Scottish government to add Scotland to the conversation. So Robert Moore says the Welsh example will be worth researching, yeah. full on anti-racist equality policy, and I racist in quotes, uh, and radical renewal of the Welsh national curriculum. It's full of promise, but will it be cruel? Yeah. And then Penny Rabinger adds um, that uh, it's an interesting example and full of hope, but alongside their declarations and obvious activity, they keep yeah. forgetting to include black and brown people around the table at events they advertise. So anti-racism has a, a person of color present when talking about anti-racism, but not when including people of color in daily activity and when acting in ways that are anti-racist and required. Any uh, thoughts or comments on example? Yeah, yeah, a lot. So, okay, so here's a paradox. So why are contexts where 
there is left history of um, anti-racist struggle is the mainstream political rhetoric more uh, progressive, that term we want to use, um, on questions of race equality and racial justice, and thinking about Scottish administration and welfare administration. Um, and one explanation for that is that substantively, relatively little is being asked of that in terms of England. So, so um, the history of anti-racism in British cities, in English cities, is, there, there is an equivalent to that, not in the political period in, in, in Wales and Scotland. Um, and nor is there um, a, a reckoning with the claims making for um, for justice, which has happened in English cities, in Wales and in Scotland. And so in a way, it's kind of, there's a, there's a kind of a paternal character to this, um, insofar as you know, administrations are willing to be more uh, re receptive, but in the knowledge that, okay, well, what does that actually mean? I mean, you know, we're, we're relatively small populations, we need inward migration to maintain our size, to justify our claim to nationhood, um, historically, both places of outward migration. Um, and so, you know, the, the conditions are different. If the conditions were more analogous to England, you know, hypothetically, mm -hmm. would they be as progressive? But that said, I don't, you know, nor do I want to kind of do down where I live. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think that the um, rhetoric does matter. I think it sets agendas. I think it's a feature of the uh, of the landscape in which racial justice plays out. Um, and I think there are lots of ways in which um, racially minoritized people in Wales and in Scotland claim ownership over things like nationhood uh, in ways in which is and not, um, not uh, replicated um, for racialized minorities in England who are much more likely to claim ownership uh, or an appeal to Britishness rather than Englishness. So, you know, mixed outcomes, but I think a lot of the stuff in in Scotland and Wales have yet to be stress tested, as it were. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. That was um That's you, are. you should have answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna answer the question, but I did have a question for you. Um no, I really enjoyed your thought, thank you. Um I so so you obviously you you spoke to kind of spoke to struggles for racial justice kind of quite in quite broad terms in your talk but as we know there are sort of multiple mm. anti-racism multiple anti-racist projects mm. um and i think for me one of the kind of exciting and interesting um uh, anti-racist uh, movements um that is uh, that we're seeing in, in britain um, in the contemporary moment is that of like police and prison abolition yeah. and indeed in your talk you also spoke to some of the questions that police and prison abolitionists are interested in in terms of um racist uh, forms of incarceration and the school to prison pipeline mentioned mm -hmm. as well at one point um and i think for, for me what's interesting about this kind of nascent um uh anti-racist movement um and it is more nascent in, in Britain as compared to the US, for example, mm. is that it's, it seems to both at the same time focus our attention on, um, on the state and state racism structures, institutions, but also make some kind of effective intervention mm. as well in terms of its invitation to, to, um, to rethink how we relate to each other, yeah. as well as, um, you know, remake, uh, the, the structures, yeah. societal structures. So I just wondered if you had any any thoughts on yeah on yeah. on abolition as a kind of idea as a movement in relation to what you're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, I thought your your question kind of goes back to legs. It does. Well, in, in terms of <laughs> in, in terms of the, the role of of, of um, affect within this. I mean, if you think, I mean, what I was trying to say earlier in the talk is that part of the reason that anti-racist mobilizations are not easily understood through typical social movement literature is that they have a wider, more expansive idea of the political. Um, and in addition to the time and period in which, you know, they've been occurring. Um, and, and with that does come, you know, opportunities to um, 
cultivate forms of empathy, but in ways which aren't um, empathy, which comes from generosity or pity, but empathy, which comes from seeing things as a shared endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're easier to achieve in, in local contexts um, than they are you know, at scale. I think, um, and I don't know if that has to do purely with the fact of, of requiring connective relationships or the fact that they need to be tied to bigger ideas about who and what we are um, as a collectivity of a society, as a nation, or many nations. Um, yeah, no, I don't have an answer to you, I'm afraid. <laughs> but it's, it's a really interesting question. I think that um, participation in um, abolition struggles or struggles for you know, to defund the police and so on, um, are, are also a means to you know, charge batteries um, to, to, uh, amongst activists, you know, um, to renew um, motivation and to you know, identify and develop touchstones for future mobilization. They all have virtue and they all have a role, even if they're engaged with, you know, with this kind of cruel optimism um, that we carry. Uh, yes. But, well, I've got a really simple question, which is, does anti-racist policies um, and structural equality address racism on an interpersonal basis? Before you answer that, can I fold a question from the chat into it, because I think it links really well, and this will be the last um, opportunity to respond. So the, the link question in the chat is from Sudeep. Who asks, how do you think we can most effectively move away from this dominant psychologized understanding of racism to one that we would see as more useful or structural? It's something that I struggle with as I study the media. So a question about interpersonal racism and a question mm -hmm. about uh, individualized racism. Yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, it also circles then back to the early discussion we were having about unconscious bias. I mean, you can unco uncouple personal attitudes from their wider social milieus, um, but I think that is a strategy and it's a narrowing of the aperture. I think that um, the language people use, the assumptions that they hold, the, the values that they promote are intimately connected you know, to the wider social movement. Um, and I don't think racism purely as a matter of language, um, anti-racism purely as a matter of language, um, addresses more fundamental um, racialized um, experiences or, you know, uh, 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 or addresses the kind of uh, the underlying problem. Um, but on the other hand, look, you know, none of us wants to work in a context. Um, none of us wants our kids to go to a school where um, those kind of microaggressions are, are a normalized feature of our existence or them. So I don't think it's unimportant. On the contrary, you know, I think that it often is something which signals uh, a deeper problem. Um, so it should be taken seriously and it should be challenged and addressed and there should be accountability for it. But I don't think language alone is a means to, um, or is, is, is a vehicle for pursuing racial Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Nasser, and thank you everyone for participating in the discussion. Um, let's give